Greetings from sunny Sydney. I'm Doug McCartney and I'm here today to read you a letter. Doesn't that sound exciting? Let me tell you, this is a most important letter. It's from the wife of a paedophile victim. And by the way, I'm sure it's paedophile and not pedophile. Um, I mean, my education ended the day I turned 15 when I left school. But even so, I've learned one or two things and I'm pretty sure that a pedophile is someone who is uh, obsessed with feet. And we're not talking here about uh, foot addicts, we're talking about men, mostly men anyway, who are obsessed sexually with children. And the writer of this letter is married to a man who, when he was a child, was molested by priests, or at least one priest, I'm not sure the full details. We'll get, we'll get to those in a minute. Now, as you know, you almost certainly heard, read, seen, that here in Australia we have a major problem with the priesthood, Catholic Church, and in particular one man, Cardinal George Pell. Now, Uncle George is the most important high-ranking Catholic in Australia. He's the third most important high-ranking man in general in the Vatican, the third top head honcho. He's not quite the head, he's the third. And yet he has been found guilty of molesting children and right now as I speak he's in prison awaiting his sentence, his full sentence. We don't know what he's going to get yet. Australia's most senior Catholic and one of the most powerful men in the Vatican has been found guilty of five child sex offences, including oral rape. And last week, after a two-month blackout, the media was finally able to tell you about it. Cardinal Sin, guilty as hell. Pray to God. His counsel, no doubt a barrister, is saying, well, look, it's no big deal. It was just penetration, vanilla penetration of a... Of a couple of boys. No big deal. <laughs> what? Since when has sticking your dick into a children's mouth been no big deal? Give me a break. The man who rose to be the Vatican's third most powerful cleric had been convicted of sexual crimes against two 13-year-old boys. A jury of 12 had found George Pell guilty of five shocking offences, which all took place inside St. Patrick's Cathedral when Pell was Archbishop of Melbourne. Now, before we continue, I've just stuck the lights on, by the way. I noticed I had just checked the video and it's a little bit dark. I'm hoping I can lighten it up shortly. We also, in this country, are blessed with a television personality, a broadcaster, called Andrew Bolt. Now, he's quite interesting sometimes. He, his big thing is he likes to be controversial. And he, what he's saying is that the jury got it all wrong, uh, that it was a mistrial, and Cardinal George Pell didn't get a fair trial. We don't know how he came to that conclusion because he wasn't there. He didn't hear, he wasn't present in court. He didn't hear the uh, complainant. He didn't hear... He wasn't on the jury. How the hell he knows more about it than the jury is a bit of a mystery. But he claims he knows it all. Now, before we begin, I shall explain to you that I am not a Catholic. I have no religious beliefs whatsoever. My mind is unpolluted with religion. I have no axe to grind. I had one unfortunate uh, sort of meeting with a Catholic priest, uh, but it, it was no big deal. Very briefly, this is when I was a, a deck boy in the Merchant Navy on board the MV Wongaroa, or Fongaroa as the Maori would have it. A uh, Catholic priest came on board. I, I was the youngest boy on the ship. Uh, he told me he knew of a 
fantastic fish and chip shop and he offered to buy me some fish and chips which sounded good to me um, so I went off with this Catholic priest and before long yeah, he kept his word he bought me some fish and chips and very nice they were too um, and before long, we, I remember we were on this sort of sand dune just near the docks. Not a huge, it was, you know, I don't know, ten foot tall, something like that. Ten feet in old currency. I'm, I'm not really with it with this meter stuff. Um, and then after I'd finished my fish and chips, he said he wanted to play a game of roly-poly. Um, and the idea was he put one hand on my shoulder and the other hand on my crutch and we were supposed to roll down this sand dune. And I felt most uncomfortable about that. I said, what do you, why, why, why do you need to put your hand on my crutch? And he, you know, he clung on to me. And I have to admit that I was a little bit frightened. Um, I pushed him off and I ran away. End of story. I wasn't damaged mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Do I have a spirit? <laughs> Um, but I never sort of completely forgot it, and funnily enough, I've never mentioned it to anyone until now. I'm 77 years old, and that would have happened to me when I was 15. No, no, 17. I was 17. I've only just sort of thought of it. It's, uh, this sort of George Pell case reminded me of that. Actually, I had more problems with cub masters and scout masters, all of whom were trying to get into my pants. But that's another story, you know, even so I seem to uh, recover. <laughs> oh, it's all weird, isn't it? It was 1996 and George Pell was the newly installed Archbishop of Melbourne. The church was grappling with an escalating scandal over clergy sexual abuse of children and the Archdiocese of Melbourne had more pedophile priests than anywhere else in the country. Archbishop George Pell was in damage control. One or two lonely voices have suggested that the Catholic Church here is in a state of crisis. They are badly mistaken. Just for a moment or two, I'll play devil's advocate. Hope you don't mind. There is nothing in the Bible against paedophilia. Nothing at all. Uh, take the example of uh, Lot and his two virgin daughters, he invited a gang of madmen to rape his two virgin daughters. After the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, when uh, this merciful father, this God thing, decided to murder, kill, destroy every man, woman, child and baby on those living in those two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, he decided, well I could kill them instantly but that's that's not painful enough I'll burn every man woman and innocent child and baby to death so that they suffer horrendously and that's what God did the only survivor survivors were Lot his wife and his two virgin daughters Lot took them up to a cave he got drunk and he raped his two daughters. The Bible, the, what he did was he tried to blame his daughters for the rape. Ha! I'd like to see any rapist, any uh, child raping father get away with that in a modern court of law. Oh, I couldn't help it, Your Worship. Uh, these two girls raped me. <laughs> yeah, right. That's one story. Another story? That's the story of King David, uh, King of the Jews. Uh, when he was an old man, uh, he needed a, a drop of Viagra or stiffies or something to get an erection. And he had his men scour the land, Egypt and Israel and just everywhere. Look here, there and everywhere for the youngest, prettiest, most alluring young virgin they could find. And they presented this young girl to him. Uh, but he, he, despite, as it says in the Bible, something about she comforted him and gave, gave him her warmth. He still couldn't get it up. <laughs> oh, what am I laughing at? I, I'm having difficulties too. I don't need to go there, do I? And there's another story. The worst one of all is when Moses 
instructs his butchers to slaughter mothers, fathers, men, women, children, brothers, sisters, slaughter everybody, kill the whole damn lot, murder them. But those little virgins, those probably underage little girly whirlies, keep alive for yourselves, says Moses. Yes, the same Moses who chiseled the Ten Commandments. The two boys were swigging from the altar wine when George Pell caught them in the act. Pell asked the boys, what are you doing here? And told them that they were in trouble. Pell approached the two boys. He then proceeded to maneuver his robes so as to pull out his penis. He pulled the first boy aside and had him crouch in front of him. Pell was standing. At this time, the boy asked to be let go, as they hadn't done anything wrong. Pell had his hand on the back of the boy's head, and his other hand at his own genital area. The other boys saw the first boy's head being lowered towards the genital area of Pell. When he'd finished with the first boy, George Pell moved on to the second. It's alleged that Pell was standing and he pushed the other boy down to a position where he was crouching or kneeling. The boy was then pushed onto Pell's erect penis so that the penis was in his mouth. This act of fellatio or oral sex lasted for a short period which the boy estimates to be a couple of minutes. You'll hear that Pell then stopped and told the boy to remove his pants. The boy stood upright and pulled down or dropped his pants and his underwear in accordance with the instruction. Pell then lowered his position so as to be almost crouched on his knees. Pell then started touching the boy's genitalia. While touching the boy's genitalia, Pell was touching his own genitalia. After a couple of minutes, Pell finished and stood up. Jesus said nothing about molestation of children. Not a word. He was obsessed with adultery. Now, don't be fooled by that passage in the Gospel of John where he forgives the woman accused of adultery. That has been proven to be what they call an interpolation, like someone wrote that and slotted it in to the Gospel of John hundreds of years later. If you care to read the Sermon on the Mount, I've yet to meet a Christian who's actually read it. They all know the first two or three lines. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the pure at heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah, all very well and good. But are you aware that Jesus informed you that if you're attracted sexually to a woman, and this could be a heterosexual man, a bisexual man, or a lesbian woman, or a bisexual woman, if you've ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart, then the only way you have any chance at all of entering the kingdom of heaven is to gouge out one eye and amputate one hand. Now just think about that. What kind of a sicko would suggest such a thing? In fact, insist upon such a thing. You don't know anyone that's sick. And yet, if you're a Christian, you worship one. The police investigation into Pell widened. New claims were made about alleged abuse in the 1970s at the Eureka Stockade Pool in George Pell's hometown of Ballarat. Damien Dignan was eight years old at the time. In 2015, he made a complaint to police. We spoke to him the following year. Father Powell was all there, up the deep end, sort of around his chest type there, and um, we loved to pick the kids up and throw them over his shoulder, or throw them up in the air, so they could have a splash. So things got a bit rough, so what happened? Uh, around the testes, around the anus. What would he do? Grab you. Um, How did it make you feel? Scared. Oh, so scared but hurt. Uh, very forceful around the anus. 
could there ever be an interpretation that it just so happened that his hands weren't slipped down there, you know, by mistake? Fair enough. One time, my got to a stage where every time he picked her up, it was there. And uh, not much fun, no. Get out of the pool. Dame Indignant said he was terrified of Pell. Probably today, I've even looked at him, probably still scared of the boy here. Don't get me wrong, I believe in the Catholic Church, I do. I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. That man is evil and he should not be there. Should not be there where he is. Um, he's got a sickness. And he told us about allegations that had happened against this other person. And that person was Lyndon Monument. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Lyndon Monument described playing the same game with George Pell in the pool. What well, was you know, his hand touching your genitals and stuff on the outside of your bathers or your shorts. And then that slowly became hand down the front of the pants or your bathers or whatever you call them. Under the water. Under the water. Lyndon Monument told police that Pell would then invite him into the change rooms. He'd undress and then he'd say to us to undress um, so we'd undress and then he'd have a towel he'd say that he'd make sure you wiped under your testicles and all that sort of stuff and while he was doing this was he wearing clothes no ballarat local phil nagel said he also saw pell in the change rooms Obviously, his kids are pretty discreetly in the corner because we didn't want anyone to see our doodles and we're just little kids. Uh, tap me on the side, look around, and there was some, um, you know, Cardinal Pell, um, stark naked, and he was actually had his tail up and he was drawing his back, and there was no discretion at all. So he's actually the first adult male I ever saw naked. I didn't like it, but um, because of the, it was a church and just he was George Pell, we just we just weren't going to ever say anything. You know what I mean? So. I just try not to think about it, to be honest. I've often wondered how anyone can become that sick. And I tell you what, I've, I've come to a conclusion here. I reckon Jesus, when he was uh, circumcised, because as you know, all Jews have to be circumcised. I think they call it a bris, don't they, when they cut off the little baby's foreskin. Even to this day, Hundreds, every year, hundreds of Jewish children suffer some kind of consequences. There's an infection gets in uh, and, and their penis turns septic. Some actually have to have their penis amputated because the, the whole thing goes so wrong. Imagine how it must have been 2,000 years ago with flint knives dirty old flint knives, no disinfectant. My guess is that Jesus lost his penis. It rotted. And as a result of that, he ended up with a hatred of sex. Lyndon and Damien went to primary school at Ballarat's epicenter of abuse, St. Alipius, where a ring of pedophile Christian brothers and a priest abused dozens of children. George Pell lived in the St. Olympias Presbytery at the same time as the notorious child abuser, Father Gerald Ridsdale. Both Lyndon and Damien told police they were also abused by teachers at the school. Lyndon's brother was one of many St. Olympias pupils who later suicided. That's why I took to drugs. You feel ashamed. And, um, yeah, and as far as you ask me how it affects me mentally, <laughs> ruined my life. 
for rawness. Damien Dignan had a drinking problem and he developed leukaemia. Police laid charges in relation to his alleged abuse, but they were dropped when he died in January 2017. He was 47. He told me he was always proud of coming forward. Okay, I've rambled on, I've gone off topic, I always do, it's one of my many weaknesses. Apparently I do have a few, bugger me. No, don't, don't bugger me. That's the one thing George Pell is not accused of. He stuck his dick into little boy's mouth, but it was only, as his barrister calls it, vanilla sex. The insertion of the penis, uh, but it was vanilla. Thank goodness for that. I reckon his counsel has just about dropped him in it, well and truly. This other case, I don't know why that was dropped. There was another case against him where he was alleged to have fondled little boys in a swimming pool. Uh, I might actually show you a little bit of a video about that. Not quite sure how I'm going to put this whole thing together, but I'll figure it out as I go. Now, here's the thing. You know, we're talking about this uh, Andrew Bolt sticking up for George Pell. Goodness knows why. But not only Andrew Bolt, but ten other people have written, what do they call them, references or something like that, testimonials saying what a great guy George Pell was. Even ex-Prime Minister John Howard has said a few words in favour of George Pell. I'll come back to that because there's something very odd about that and I'll point that out to you later. But these people all saying what a wonderful guy he was. He had this quality, that quality, and all the other qualities. What a load of bollocks, excuse me. But Jimmy Savile could have had hundreds of people writing testimonials on his behalf. You know, Jimmy, oh, he's such a, uh, he's such a fun guy. Uh, you know, and he's so kind to everybody, to children, you know, whoever he meets, he's got a good word for. And uh, not only that, he's, he's donated tens of thousands of pounds to charity. He's a top guy. Well, George Pell is the Jimmy Savile of the Catholic Church. Six months after the Ballarat men went to police, another man came forward. Les Tyak told police that in the mid-1980s, he saw Pell in the change rooms at the Torquay Life Saving Club. When I walked in, I saw a fellow there crisscrossing across the back, toweling himself off. And there was three young uh, kids, about eight to ten years of age. They were about two, two metres across from him, uh, also getting changed. Um, I went into the shower, and uh, I would have been in the showers for probably five to ten minutes. When I came out, uh, this fellow, um, was facing the boys with the towel over the over his right shoulder and I thought that to be a very odd situation is it here I was in in the shower he he had not got dressed he was facing the boys and I thought then immediately there's something not right here I said to the boys if you're finished off you go we'll see you again some other time and I uh, said to uh, this fellow uh, George I know what you're up to, get dressed, piss off and don't come back to this club again. If I see you back here, I'll call the police. And George was and George Pell? George was George Pell. So what you're saying is that you thought that George Pell was exposing himself to those boys? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I have no doubt whatsoever. Cardinal Pell, what's your response to the charges? You're guilty, Cardinal. Absolute key. Mate, you're Pell. County Court Chief Judge Peter Kidd described Pell's crimes as callous, brazen offending. He exploited two vulnerable boys and there was an element of force. There was an element of brutality to this assault. It was an attack. George Pell maintains his innocence and is appealing. Well, George Pell is the Jimmy Savile of the Catholic Church.